It's, it's a no for me. Um, but anyway, a people's fascination with death is very valid. Death is fascinating. Why do you think death is fascinating? Why does it fascinate us? Why does it scare us and fascinate us at the same time? Because we've never died before. We want to know what happens. We don't want to die, but we want somebody to tell us. What happens when you die? What's going to happen? Do you feel anything? Do you, like, what, what is it? Um, but um, to think that all the wealth, education, status, careers, relationships, growth, maturity, and development that we have experienced and lived throughout our life, to have it all come to a screeching halt and just be stripped away at death, just stripped away, it is both scary and fascinating. Very scary, very fascinating. All of these celebrities that we idolize, the rich people that we want to be more like, and the people on social media that we think have those perfect lives that we sometimes wish we could emulate. Just like I told you guys a couple weeks ago, none of that matters because at the end of life, we all going in the same ground, in the same box coffin. Maybe if you're rich, they give you a glass coffin or they pack some jewelry on you, but don't nobody care about the worms. That's it. Worms can't tell the difference. They cannot tell the difference. There are no mansions underground. It's just dirt and worms. And so I find that the things we can't experience or understand, they usually are the most intriguing, right? The most intriguing. As tourists, we even like to visit places where famous people have died or are buried. Here's a secret. Um, growing up, I was so fascinated with Princess Diana. She's like before y'all's time. But anybody heard of Princess Diana? Oh, yeah. I love her so much. I thought when I was younger, I thought she was the most beautiful woman in the world. She was so graceful and she had the rosiest cheeks and she had such poise about her and she had the most beautiful clothing and smile. She looked like a Disney princess to me, like a real live Barbie doll or Disney princess. And when I was younger, I was so intrigued by her. I was 11 years old in 1997 when she died such a horrific and tragic death. And so um, years ago, back in like 2016, I went to France with my husband and one of the first things I did was visit her memorial. It's called the Flame of Liberty. And although Diana lived in England, um, at the time of her death, she was being chased by the paparazzi in France. You guys remember that? And she kind of sped down the highway with her boyfriend. And as she sped through a tunnel, um, the car crashed into something. And Diana and her boyfriend, they both died on the spot. Although I think the queen, I ain't going to say nothing. <laughs> but, but, but the USA, we didn't go get into that. The USA had previously given France a statue called the Flame of Liberty for the work that France had done on the restoration of the Statue of Liberty in New York City. And so the city of France used that Flame of Liberty and they placed it just above the tunnel where Princess Diana was killed. And so now it's a very popular tourist attraction. And baby, the first thing I did when I touched down in France was not to go see the Eiffel Tower or the Mona Lisa. It was to see the Flame of Liberty, the spot where Princess Diana died. And so when it comes to death, some of us are fascinated with it. But when we think of our own death or the deaths of people that are so close to us, well, now we got a problem. Now we got a problem. A French writer once wrote, about 30 years ago, that looking into the sun is easier than contemplating our own death. When death becomes personal, it becomes harder to wrestle with, makes us feel uneasy. We don't like it, and it should. What isn't there to be afraid of? Baby, that's the ultimate end. You ain't coming back. Do you fear death? Some people don't. When I ask this question, I have had martyrs, 17-year-old martyrs, be like, no, let me die. <laughs> that, that's what they say. <coughs> Do y'all fear death? Yeah. No. Yes. See? It's always <laughs> one. <laughs> Why? Because it's not like I'm 
scared of death. Like, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm just scared of not like completing everything I want to do in life. So you're scared of not living right? Yeah. Okay. Somebody tell me why they are afraid of death. Why do you fear it? It's because I think it's baked into us like biologically. Like, it, like our survival instincts to fear death. Yeah. Our survival instincts is to fear to die. Yeah. Okay. Like, like if you're staying on like train tracks, you're not just gonna sit there and let a train hit you. You're gonna like, you know, move out the way, you know. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Why do you fear death? Because you don't know what comes after that. And anything anything unknown is scary for a lot of people. I like that. Because we don't know what's going to happen after that. Shit, am I going to die again? <laughs> like, what's, <laughs> what's, what's going to happen? I like that. Okay. Okay. Euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, they usually refer to the deliberate action taken with the intention of ending a life in order to relieve persistent suffering. With euthanasia... A doctor is allowed by law to end a person's life by painless means as long as the patient and their family agree. But what if the patient is in a vegetative state and God forbid they haven't wrote a will or they haven't given anybody any permission to do anything? This is where it gets ethical and this is where it gets tricky. Assisted suicide means that a doctor assists a patient to commit suicide if they request it. So there's two types of euthanasia. There's voluntary euthanasia and involuntary euthanasia. So voluntary euthanasia is when it is conducted with consent. Voluntary euthanasia is currently legal in Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and the states of Oregon and Washington in the United States. Non-voluntary euthanasia is when euthanasia is conducted on a person who's unable to consent due to their current health condition. And so in this scenario, the decision is made by another appropriate person on behalf of the patient based on their quality of life and their suffering. And then you have involuntary is when euthanasia is performed on a person who would be able to provide informed consent, but they do not, either because they don't want to die or because they weren't asked. And when that happens, what's that called? Child, that's murder. Oh, okay. oh my God. <laughs> I thought it was a more complex. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hold on, we're Everybody's crying like, wait, what is it? It's murder. Uh, okay. Absolutely, it's murder. Killing somebody against their will. Doesn't matter if they're sick. If you don't have their consent and you don't have the consent of their family members, it's murder. You're going to go to jail for murder. It, 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 it's, it's what it is. That's crazy. <laughs> I want to share a disclaimer, though, as we navigate through grief. So before I start, um, I just want you to keep in mind that I am a professor, I am a psychologist, I am an author, but I'm also a grieving mother. So you don't know who's who gonna show up today. Might be everybody, you don't know, you don't know. So just keep that in mind. Um, as I utilize academia, research, and your textbook um, to not only teach you about grief, um, but also use examples from my own grieving process to help you get a better understanding of it. Um, so before we get to talking about grief, I wanna revert back to our conversation about unique death and dying practices. Um, when we were talking about drive-through funerals, there is a, also another documentary um, up above, that one up there, it has a video of uh, sky burials, jazz funerals, green funerals. Um, so if you wanna go back and take a look at it, you can. All right, so grief. Um, all of us, we're gonna suffer a lot of losses over the course of our lifetime. And anytime we lose somebody, lose somebody, be it through death or separation, we experience something called grief, bereavement, and mourning. Bereavement is the state of condition caused by the loss through death. Grief is the sorrow, the hurt, the anger, the guilt, the confusion, and all the other feelings. Those green funerals. Um, so if you want to go back 
and take a look at it, you can. All right, so grief. Um, all of us, we're gonna suffer a lot of losses over the course of our lifetime. And anytime we lose somebody, lose somebody, be it through death or separation, we experience something called grief, bereavement, and mourning. Bereavement is the state of condition caused by the loss through death. Grief is the sorrow, the hurt, the anger, the guilt, the confusion, and all the other feelings that arise from suffering through a loss. Mourning is the ways in which we express our grief. That's the difference between the three. So for example, in some cultures, you can tell when people are in a state of bereavement and mourning because of the clothing that they wear. They'll wear certain clothing. Mourning is highly influenced by culture. So for example, some mourning might be influenced by wearing all black, attending funerals, and having an official period of grief. For other cultures, it might mean drinking, wearing white, and marrying the deceased spouse. How's that for a slap in the face? <laughs> I always tell my husband, <laughs> always tell my husband that if I die before him, if he ever gets married again, I will find a way to come back and haunt the both of them. Just no ma'am. You cannot get married. Even if I die, I don't care. I don't care. Does not count. That's cheating. And it will literally be over my dead body. Exactly. We're not doing that. Anyway. Um, grief corresponds to the emotional reactions following loss, whereas mourning is the culturally approved behavioral manifestations of those feelings. And so because of that, a lot of mourning rituals might be fairly standard within a culture. And so here in the United States, anytime somebody dies, we have a funeral. We wear black. We wear white. We talk about their accomplishments here on earth. We put them in the ground. We have a repast where we eat, drink, and try to be merry. And then what we do, we go back to our lives. Period of mourning, over. But even though the mourning is over, the grieving process has only begun. Grieving process has only begun. Grief is hard. It's a strong, sometimes overwhelming emotion for people. It's the natural reaction to loss and it is both a universal and a personal experience. And although grief is conventionally focused on the emotional response to loss, grief also has physical, cognitive, behavioral, social, cultural, spiritual, and philosophical dimensions to it. It gets deep. And one word, baby, it's deep, very deep. Our personal experience with grief, they vary and they're influenced by the nature of the loss. And check this out. By loss, I don't necessarily mean death. We can grieve anything. We don't just grieve in death. Loss can be the ending of an important relationship, a job, a loss through theft. Somebody stole something from us, a loss of independence through disability, a treasured pet, a home, or another emotionally significant possession. But unfortunately, because this world is so rigid and pessimistic, besides death, we don't really acknowledge those other forms of grief, which is why they're often labeled disenfranchised. And the pain that we feel is often compounded by the feeling that we don't have the permission to experience it. Oh, don't get me on my soapbox. Don't get me started. Let me tell you this. Don't you ever, all of you in here, don't you ever allow anyone to determine what you have a right to grieve over. A loss is a loss, and whatever your loss may be, grief will be the acute pain that accompanies it. Don't ever let anybody tell you what you don't have a right to do. And because grief is a reflection of what we love, it can feel all encompassing. It'll leave you feeling numb and removed from your daily life, unable to carry on with your regular duties and your regular responsibilities. And so when we're talking about loss, I believe all types of loss should be valid and respected because they all bring grief in some way. But I think we spend too much time putting an emphasis on death when it comes to loss because the grief we feel from it is often most painful. Grief is very layered. It's very layered. The loss of a job, you're going to grieve for a season. Y'all get kicked out of school. You lose your scholarships. You get redshirted. You get dropped from a team. It's seasonal. It's seasonal, but it's still grief. The loss of a loved one, you're going to grieve deeper and over the course of the rest of your life. 
We all come to this fork in the road one day where we say, my loved one just died. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to move forward. A mere 10 words synopsing an experience that we will all have to go through at some point in our lives. It's an inevitable part of the human experience and it's also one of the hardest things to handle. Very hard. Baby, it'll tear a hole through you. Whenever somebody you love dies, no matter the circumstances, it's going to tear a hole and it's going to leave a scar and it's supposed to. It's supposed to. Your scars, they say, are a testament to the relationship that you had with that person. And so if the scar is deep, that usually means the love was deep. Scars are a testament to life. They are a testament that we can love deeply, that we can live deeply and be cut or even gouged and that we can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is usually stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. Grief is a part of life. It's a part of life. And there was a woman way, way back in the day who fought and then she reported her interviews with the dying for the first time in her book on death and dying. That was the name of her book. And it was said, what the dying have to teach doctors, nurses, clergy, and their own families. And so in that book, she developed the five stages of grief model to describe people who had terminal illnesses that were facing their own death. But it was soon adapted as a way of thinking about grief in general. So we have the five stages of grief that all of you, I'm sure, have heard of because of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And so Elizabeth suggested that we go through five distinct stages of grief after the loss of a loved one. We go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. But you want to know something? They don't always happen in order. But they're often talked about as if they happen in order moving from one stage to the other. And so you might hear people say things like, oh, I've moved on from denial, and now I think I'm entering into the angry stage. Sometimes it might happen like that, but other times it's not the case. In fact, Kubler said in her writing that the stages are nonlinear, meaning that people can experience those aspects of, aspects of grief at different times, and they do not happen in one particular order. You might not experience all of the stages. You might find feelings are quite different with different bereavements. It just depends. So number uh, denial is the first of the five stages of grief, and it usually helps us to survive the loss. And so in this stage, the world becomes meaningless and overwhelming. Life makes no sense. We're in a state of constant shock and denial. We go numb. We wonder how the heck we going to go on. And if we can go on, why should we go on? And so we try to find a way to simply get through each day. Denial and shock, they help us to cope and it makes survival possible. In my own experience, I don't ever remember being in denial, but I do remember being in a state of shock. Like I can distinctly remember watching my beautiful baby riding this red scooter in front of me at the park. I watched him turn the bin and disappear around the curb. And by the time I caught up to them 30 seconds later, all there was was a parked scooter. And so I remember panicking because like any toddler mom, when you don't see them, you know, they ran off somewhere. And I remember thinking, oh, good, this big giant park, where the heck did he run off to? And the minute somebody told me he ran into the water and that he was under the water, my heart went into a vice grip and I went into immediate shock, immediate shock. That shock got me through him being pulled out of the water without a heartbeat or a pulse. It got me through seeing red sirens on the ambulance truck and white and blue police sirens. It got me through conversations with doctor when they used words like your four-year-old baby was dead on arrival and it took us 15 minutes to get his heart back beating again. That shot got me through four months of hospital stay, packing up my life and traveling to every doctor on the planet in search of help. Literally, every time I would look at my baby and look at what had become of him, it was that shock that kept me from dropping dead. And when you have children, baby, you're going to understand. Denial and shock helps us to pace our feelings of grief. 
There is a grace in both of them. It's a grace. It's nature's way of letting in only as much as we can handle. And then you have anger. The next stage is anger. Anger is a necessary stage of the healing process, and it should be. How dare life snatch away the people that we love? How dare we be taught to love others, build connections with other people, and then lose the same people that we were taught to love and never be able to see them again? It should make you angry. It should piss you off. It should. At some point, it's going to make you angry, and it should. It's okay. It's normal. There's a lot of other emotions under anger, and you'll get to them in time, but anger is the emotion that we're most used to managing. And the truth is that anger has no limits. It can extend not only to your friends, the doctors, your family, yourself, and your loved one who died, but also to whatever God you believe in. Underneath anger is pain. It's your pain, your personal pain. And so it's natural to feel deserted and abandoned, but we live in a society that fears anger. So when it comes to grief, anger is not a bad thing. Anger in the realm of grief is strength, and it can be an anchor that can give you a temporary structure to the nothingness of loss, just to feel something. Grief, at the beginning, it feels like being lost at sea. This is what I say. No connection to anything. And then you get angry to someone, I'm angry at somebody. So maybe it's a person who didn't attend a funeral. Maybe the person who's not around. Maybe a person who's different now that your loved one has died. And so now suddenly you have a structure, your emotions, your anger toward them. And so that anger becomes a bridge over the open sea. And so it's a connection from you to them. And it's something to hold on to. And a connection made from the strength of anger, it feels better than nothing sometimes. We usually know more about suppressing anger than feeling it. But anger as it relates to grief, it's okay. It's just another indication of the end. I remember being angry at four people. I remember being angry with God because, oh my God, all of the grace and mercy I felt like he'd shown me throughout my life. Why couldn't he be gracious and merciful here? Over the course of my life, I have literally dodged bullets like I have come from extreme abuse and lived to tell the story. I remember being sent from house to house to house with no family and no home and I still live to tell the story. There were people I grew up with that swore I would be dead by 18 and swore I would never be anything other than a statistic and yet here I am, Dr. Jackson, living to tell the story. And so why couldn't my baby live to tell his story? It's natural, angry. I was angry at my mother because she never even wanted children. She couldn't stand me. She didn't like the child she was given, and she did everything but succeeded in killing me, and I turned out just fine. Meanwhile, I have always wanted children. I adore my children, and I did everything I could to raise them well and nurture them correctly, and so how come my mama got a pass and I did not? How come? How does she get to walk around telling everybody how much her daughter is a doctor and a professor and an author and a world-renowned speaker and influencer? And I have to tell people that my five-year-old baby drowned and he died. She was a negligent mother. I was not. How come this happened to me and not her? Anger. And then I was angry at myself. I felt so guilty for what happened to that sweet baby if I had just been 30 seconds sooner, if we had just not gone to the park that day and stayed home and followed COVID restrictions, if I had not had the dog with me and been so distracted. I know as parents, we can't be there for every waking moment, but we usually succeed in being present to prevent the really dangerous moments. And so why couldn't I succeed in being present to prevent a really dangerous moment? And I felt like I was a horrible mother, that poor baby. Poor baby, because of my negligence, he's gone. Angry at myself. And then I was angry at my husband. Why couldn't this have happened on his watch? He's usually the clumsy one. He's usually the clumsy one. He's usually the one not paying attention, and I'm usually the one paying too much attention and fussing at him for not paying enough attention. I distinctly remember quite a few times where the kids were playing outside and my husband was distracted and they ran off and we couldn't find them. And he would come in the house like, baby, Judah ran off and I don't know where he is. 
That's happened so many times. And I'm screaming to the top of my lungs and I'm running outside trying to find him. And I'm telling my husband off for not paying attention, but we found him and he was okay. And so why is it that when the baby was left in my eyesight, something horrific happened? Why couldn't it have happened when my husband was on baby duty? I don't want to be responsible for that. Anger. And you're going to feel your own emotions of anger. And that is okay. Allow yourself to feel them. The next one is bargaining. So before loss, it seems like you will do anything if your loved one would just be spared. And so after a loss, bargaining might take the form of a temporary truce. What if I devote the rest of my life for helping other people? Then I can wake up and realize this has all been a bad dream. We become lost in a maze of if only or what if statements. We want life returned to what it was. We want our loved one restored. We want to go back in time, find the tumor sooner, recognize the illness more quickly, stop the accident from happening. If only, if only, if only. And so guilt is often bargaining's companion. The if onlys that cause us to find fault in ourselves and we think that we could have done something differently. We might even bargain with the pain. We'll do anything not to feel the pain of this loss. We remain in the past and we try to negotiate our way out of the hurt. People often think of the stages as lasting as weeks or months, but they forgot that the stages are responses to feelings that can last for minutes or hours as we flip in and out of one to the other. We do not enter and leave each individual stage in a linear fashion. We may feel one, and then we might feel, feel another, and then we go back to the first one. And then there's depression. So after bargaining, our attention moves squarely into the present. You get empty feelings that present themselves, and grief enters our lives on a deeper level, but much deeper than you could have ever imagined. And so that depressive stage, it feels as though it's going to last forever. Trust me, I have been there. It feels like it's going to last forever. But it's important to understand that that depression, that's not a sign of mental illness. I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm talking about situational depression. And situational depression is, a pro, is, a, is an appropriate response to a great loss. We withdraw from life. We feel left in a, in, a, in a fog of this intense sadness. And we wonder if there's any point in going on alone. Why go on at all? Depression after a loss is too often seen as unnatural. It's a state to be fixed. Somebody's going to try to fix you or they're going to get you to snap out of it. Come on, you'll be okay. The answer is no. It's not a situation you can fix and you can't get somebody to snap out of it. The best thing somebody has done for me when I went through a depressive state is to sit in it with me, cry with me, grieve with me. Don't tell me it's going to be okay because it's not. Your babies are here, mine is not. Just sit in it with me and be a good friend. Be a good husband. Be a good whoever the person choose, chose to be. Not to pick me up and say, okay, I'm going to fix it. No, you're not. You're not. How? How? Um, I remember my strong faith over the course of this journey. I remember believing that my God would do it. Um, remember when we spoke about death last week through the eyes of people during different phases of development, we spoke about early childhood and John Piaget's pre-operational stage um, where I was telling you guys that children in early childhood, they have a hard time distinguishing reality from a fantasy and that they felt like the dead could just snap out of it and wake back up or that time could be reversed and that things would go back to normal. And I told you that about my Ava, who despite uh, what state her little brother was in, she just knew he would be okay. And she knew that he would just snap, snap out of it. What I did not tell you was that Ava wasn't the only person stuck in a pre-operational stage of, diff, of, of thinking. Her mama was too. I had such a childlike faith. I just knew that my baby would be okay. And so that faith that I had, it gave me the ability to look at him every single day in the state that he was in and say, just like Ava, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. As parents, we hate to see our children suffer. And so whether it's a bruise from a fall or from somebody that hurt their feelings, we hate to see our babies hurt. And so for me to watch my baby every single solitary day struggling to breathe, he can't stop drooling, he can't eat, he's in and out of hospitals, all kind of tubes down his throat, going through his body in this vegetative, wakeful state. To see him like that, my mama heart nearly bled to death, but it was my faith that kept me going. 
Every day I would wake up and I would say, okay, baby, today is the day. You're going to walk today. You're going to talk today. That feeding tube is going to come out and you're going to be able to eat today. I didn't care what reality looked like. You couldn't convince me that the doctors were right. I didn't give a shit about science. I didn't care. He going to defy science. Millions of people were following this story and his progress all over the world. And so while millions applauded my faith, there were a few handful that said, this is ridiculous. That baby ain't going to survive. Why is she making him suffer? Why didn't she just pull a plug and let him die? She's a stupid mother. I would never. I could never. And you know what? I didn't care about any of it. I didn't care about any of it. I was determined to believe that just like my daughter, that all would be well. And every day, nothing. Day after day for 15 months, he never got well. And then one day, and I don't remember what day it was, but one night, I remember taking a walk with Judah, and he was in his stroller, and I was walking through my subdivision, and I remember just being tired. You're just tired. Being physically, emotionally, and spiritually drained. My faith was running dry. 